OK. Um, that was fantastic. We'll just take, say, maybe 15 or 20 minutes of questions before we split you up into your structured and non-structured groups. So has anyone got any questions? OK. Um, Hi. Um, uh, I have one uh, question and two very short comments. Okay. I'm a short lady. I'm here, yeah. <laughs> uh, so I mean, uh, the question is about the first part of your lecture where you talked about the philosophical underpinnings and you know, draw, drew on a lot of his philosophical arguments. And you mentioned that culture itself uh, has become a factor of production. And uh, several theorists, you know, of uh, information society, uh, post-industrial society, you know, Manuel Castells, network society, uh, they talked about information becoming a resource, uh, becoming a factor in production. Uh, when did this uh, narrow technical definition of information turn into a much more encompassing uh, definition of culture? You know, when did that turn take place? And how do we understand this shift? And what philosophical argument should we draw on to understand this shift? This is my question. And uh, two short comments. And uh, the first comment is on the notion of s the state that underlies a lot of your arguments. Uh, you, the way you look at the state, all of you, uh, is, uh, is that the state is unitary, focused, proactive, and many a times it doesn't work in post-colonial post societies, the so-called post-colonial societies like India, where the state itself is ridden with conflicts. It's again the, fo the field of force that you were talking about. So you see the same conflictual mm -hmm. you know, field uh, are right at the bottom and also at the top. You know, there are conflicts between different levels of the state. So the notion of the state as a unitary entity is something that we need to probably question in the post-colonial context. And if we do that, and what kind of framework should we use, you know, to understand that kind of situation? And my um, last comment is um, on uh, your point on how the discourse need not translate on the ground in the way it intends to. And uh, this was, in fact, I wanted to say this yesterday, but uh, uh, we did, a, we did a, a, a sociological study on the IT industry in Bangalore. And believe me, the discourse is similar, you know, uh, worker as an autonomous, self-motivated individual who contributes and so on and so forth. But this is the discourse and uh, everybody is familiar with that. Uh, and in fact, uh, uh, the vice president of a high-tech uh, company in Bangalore uh, candidly said, that I don't want this place to be seen as Bangalore. I want this place to be seen as Santa Clara. I mean, he, he, he really means that, yeah? <laughs> and in terms of organizational culture, in terms of the uh, architectural design, uh, it, it just looks like Santa Clara, and, and, and it is the organizational policy to replicate the same, same model. But this is at the discourse level. Mm -hmm. But what happens at the ground is a far more complex process, and the organization is aware of it. So the regional you know, groupings and linguistic groupings and several other groupings, you know, they are managed in a much more compli complicated way. Uh, and that cannot probably uh, map on neatly uh, on this discourse of individual contributor. You know, this yeah. two first question, of course, you know, that question still remains, and two comments. Thanks. <laughs> Well, thank you. That uh, <clears throat> uh, I agree with. With um, in fact, thank you for bringing it up. The state. I, I hadn't. I had only used the word, but I hadn't actually gone into discussing it in the same way that I discussed the question of agency on the behalf of movements as 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 being situated in a complex field of force. The state as well, and, and you're absolutely right. In fact, it, it's it's uh, borne out by the example of the. Secretary of Security, who's put there at one moment, but comes into conflict with the Chief of Police. That is that two members of, uh, who are occupying in a particular government, the state, who are, right, enter into that conflict. And uh, in that case, the Secretary of Security lost. All right? And that had an effect on some of the organizing. In the case now that he's in, in, in Nova Iguazu, which is a different place, there's a different kind of negotiation taking place there. So I, I think you're absolutely right. And there's not only that kind of, there's many different levels. At, at trade, 
the, the I, I've been tracking and and am writing on the uh, uh, negotiate the 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 conflict in Costa Rica around the free trade agreement with the United States and the Dominican Republic, Central American Free Trade Agreement and the Dominican Republic, and uh, you could, there was no unitary state. There were many different positions within the same party that occupied the state, right? Uh, as well as in opposition groups. There were opposition groups because they were manufacturers, not ma they were uh, uh, farmers that grew rice, they were going to lose out. So they were against it. But the high-tech people were for it, right? And so they were, they were differently positioned, and one has to then survey that complexity to see uh, how some notion of agency will play out because it's, it's really caught in, the, in, the, in, the, in that very complex terrain. Um, yes, we agree on the discourse on the ground, I mean, the activity on the ground being different than the discourse. And as for the uh, information society issue, information is resource becoming culture is resource, um, I think some, uh, some of the people in culture piggybacked on, on those notions. The information society, Castells himself, would include, would make asides, never went deeply into culture, but there were always asides to the cultural spheres, right? And so somehow they were yoked, and it's not yeah. clear, like, like, like in... Especially the, later on, didn't he do later on in Castell's stuff? It, it was already in the more? network society. If you look through it, you could find references, but they're like mm -hmm. throwaway references. That's not the main issue. People who were then trying to promote uh, empowering, let's say, cultural initiatives will use that. I mean, I have to be frank is that in some cases in, in negotiations with, with, uh, with, not with secretariats of culture, but when, when the secretariat of culture has been able to get the attention of the minister of finance and so on and so forth in order to make the argument for the relevance of culture, one uses such statements. Right? One, I mean, in this case myself, will make references to those very cautiously in order to see what resonance one can get from those other sectors, whether it's security, uh, finance, so on and so forth. Right? So, and I think that probably a lot of cultural policy uh, uh, consultants and managers, so on and so forth, will play the discourse to see how they can get other sectors involved in, in, their, in their activities. But uh, I think that uh, philosophically um, that uh, there's more to it than just piggybacking on the information society, right? Uh, and it, some part of it already goes back to the, uh, I think it was already mentioned yesterday when all these ins uh, departments in different organizations used to be arts and humanities or arts and started becoming culture and creativity. They were undergoing a kind of anthropological cultural turn, right? The understood that everybody has culture and creativity. And then how do you harness that? It's part of a neoliberal turn too that I think it was Andrew that mentioned, or at least in his paper, the Larson American Canvas where if, if you go back and look at that from 19, 1997, you could see clearly how uh, cultural policy discourse is taking on culture to play uh, the role of being able to achieve economic growth, solve all kinds of political and, and social problems, so on and so forth. And so it's clear in the 90s that you could see that at work. But it had a cultural turn before, I mean, the anthropological turn before it. Okay, can we have one at the back and then Andrew? Uh, George, I've, I've, I've thought of asking you this question any number of times and I never had <laughs> privately. Finally got you me. Me. But I finally got you because it's the first time that I actually hear you talk about the experience of culture, a book that I have taught many times now since it came out. Um, my students often um, ask me the following question. These guys trying to have it both ways, <laughs> okay? I'm, I'm talking grad students, uh, mostly. Uh, and the other question they ask me is, 
And what do we do with this? I mean, a literature department. Okay. Okay, so that's, yeah. Um, because th they detect three different registers in your book and in your presentation today for those who have not read the book. There is a, cons a conspiracy tone, there is an analytical level, and then there is an activist level to the book. The conspiracy one has to do with the thesis on governmentality and the way in which the aesthetic, expressive, and community formation and productivity have been harnessed by governmentality and are you know, presented as models for development, redevelopment, uh, gentrification, etc., etc. The uh, analytical is, well, he is simply trying to understand what uh, social processes are happening now and providing a model for that understanding and a recognition that those uh, unharnessed uh, powers uh, of modernity, of the expressive aesthetic and community, the things that have been left behind had now been made central to projects of governmentality and the regulation of populations. Uh, is simply the way the game is being played and that's what's on the ground. Thus, you are better off if you know that that is the case. And then, of course, there is a recognition, hey, this guy is very networked. He knows a whole lot about social movements, is connected to a number of them, seems to have an activist agenda. Okay? So with that, with that reading of the three <coughs> sides of your book and your presentation uh, today, um, I wanted to ask you straight out the question about governmentality. Uh, I do not share necessarily my students' skepticism about this work. I, I admire it, actually. But I do think that when it comes to go your use of the notion of governmentality in the book, you are trying to have it both ways. And I want you to uh, uh, tell me in what way is that. <laughs> um, OK? So that. Uh, well, aesthetic, uh, uh, creative aspects of life and community uh, life have been made part of a governmental project. But you seem to find resources of hope in that space. Yeah? Yes. How is that compatible? <laughs> <laughs> right, next question. <laughs> How is that compatible with the concept of governmentality itself? Okay, so that's right. one question. And the other one has to do with the professional dilemmas of, uh, of our students and ourselves, um, especially those of us who are, uh, uh, like Toby would say, text-based and can have a hard time going out onto other dimensions of life that are textual in a different way or are directly non-textual. And there is the question of what do we do with this? I mean, what do you study? Do you have to become an anthropologist? Because, and I will finish with this, and I know this was a little long, but I dream of asking you this question in this <laughs> terms. <laughs> because of uh, something that brings us back to the discussion we were having yesterday. We are talking about culture, no doubt about it. But we are clearly seeing two different uh, uh, forms of culture. One that the traditional humanities have studied, which are text-based, author-centered, uh, creativity in terms of originality-based, and then there is this other one, which is a notion of culture that is social, that is not necessarily creative in the same sense of originality, but is life producing and reproducing where reproduction has as much value as originality. Uh, and community building and yeah. ties creating, et cetera, et cetera. And my students by training are much better off analyzing texts that are based on the first concept of culture and have difficulty understanding or even working on processes that refer to the second concept of culture. Right. Well, uh, thank you very much because <laughs> it, 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 it lays out very clearly what's going on in that book. Uh, and I should say that what the governmentality stuff is, is, is a rehearsal of the arguments, at least or maybe one maybe always takes a distance or one has a different perspective than when one wrote something. I am quite skeptical about the force the governmentality has. All right? So I know that uh, we all know the arguments of the life-producing tendencies and everything that then exercise and produce individuals, but it's a more complex issue than, than the way it's laid out and that 
people on the ground, as was being said before, don't just cookie cutter come out and, and act according to the discourse. Or they might often express that discourse, but it doesn't necessarily mean that they're giving it the same meaning or even the same behavior attached to it. So, um, and I see that in the working of movements. There's a reflection, I think, in, in, in this difference between what has to do with governmentality, laying that out, and this other view that has something to do with, um, well, at least now, but even back then to some degree. There's a certain pragmatism in, in when one has to then deal with communities or with, with agencies, so on and so on, and try to get things done, like what I was saying before. In order to try to convince people who might be from the Ministry of Finance or Security or Migration or Health that they might want to invest in some initiative that has cultural elements to it but that's oriented towards youth in El Salvador that are in gangs. That's an alternative to uh, zero tolerance and extermination. Right? One invokes a series of arguments that one knows might have some receptivity. All right. And one's making a bid there, it's, but there's a, there's a lot of you know, uh, hit and miss and uh, contingency to that. So my, ex, my, my view of that really conditions how I see these, con, these governmentality arguments. Um, as so I, I think now, as far as the professional issue, I, I think that's one of the reasons why we're having this seminar, that, that to, to bring out the importance of, of forms of analysis and action that are not just interpretive. Not that the interpretive should be cast aside. I mean, I wouldn't say that, but that I think one needs some uh, really needs to understand how both work. In fact, as I think it was Toby, it was brought up yesterday, we were discussing the whole question of the interpreter, the textual. In some, in literature departments, often you don't know how the book got produced and so on and so forth, right? What are the mechanisms for it? And some of them actually go through these processes, right? When you want to look at a particular policy for what gets published by, by a national publishing company. You need to look at those kinds of things. And you, you know, well, you yourself have worked on canon information. So you know what some of those processes are. They're not just interpretive. They have to look at the conditions of the production of the text, which are not just between the two covers. And um, so I think that that's part of what we're looking at. Even at the textual, right? we have to look at those uh, as well. And I think that they do shed light on some textual, on, on what are perceived to be purely textual issues. Okay. Uh, I couldn't agree with George more about that last part. And as an aside to Juan, I would say that, I mean, I would go further than George and say that if the only consequence of a workshop like this thinking about the creative industries was in fact to draw text-based people outside of their comfort zone then it will have been worthwhile in and of itself because uh, I actually do think that comfort zone is part of the problem but we could talk about that later I think over lunch. Um, I just wanted to go back to the, uh, the first question about the, the, the free trade, um, the collapse of the free trade initiatives or efforts at global free trade initiatives because I too think it's you know, mind-numbingly dumb to make declarations about the, the failure of the anti-globalization movement, especially at a moment when, you know, everyone can see that the WTO is now dead in the water. I mean, it is completely fucked. And I wanted to ask George what you think the overall consequences of that will be for the topic we're discussing, because, you know, as we know, the U.S., uh, you know, trade policy uh, folks have been predicting this and anticipating this for a long time, and they do these bilateral trade treaties now. That's been their policy. Right. They know that the WTO is likely exactly. to collapse, but now that it really is, what's the consequences for things like GATS, 
you know, the general agreement on trade yeah. and services, because these services, the, the whole debate about service provision, the liberalization of services, does affect the creative industries, the development of creative industries in a huge way. I'm not familiar with that research if it's being done. I mean, I'm familiar with the research in higher education because there's been an immense amount of resistance to including uh, higher education in GATS, you know, primarily right. because in the vast majority of countries, higher education is a public mandate, public yeah. universities. And under GATS, if, if those services were liberalized, then private foreign providers have to be given exactly the same attention on the part of the state as public entities domestically, you know, right. which would be disastrous for most public education systems. But um, I'm not aware of a similar research being done on the consequences for creative industries topic. And I'm just wondering if you or anyone else does know or is familiar there, with that. There, there was a reference here um, to a site in Brazil that is working on this, I mean a, a group of people, a uh, progressive think tank of people on cultural policy. And they, they go by this very uh, um, almost a misnomer, culture and market. It's like when I did privatization of culture project at NYU, some people would think that I, I was promoting the privatization of culture. <laughs> so they have a project called culture and market, but their analyses of it and they, they're very influential in Brazilian cultural policy. And they're particularly trying to, to keep Brazil, and they were somewhat successful with Gilles, but Gilles, again, was Minister of Culture. He's not the Minister of Finance. Again, we're talking about, where, where was the state again? The, that, that the state has many different levels, right? And, and conflicts within it. But uh, what's interesting about Gilles is that he was moving into the culture industries issue. Right? and trying to get it out of IP concerns and out of also the services, whether for film and other issues. Probably Toby knows more about GATS in Brazil and China and India than I do. But uh, I do know some of the debates in Brazil around this. But again, it's going to depend, like in the case of Costa Rica, on what sector of the economy is going to benefit by maintaining or not. Because there's a lot of, I mean, the, the way that, that corporations function is Brazil's filled with transnational corporations that are going to promote the gaps. And then there's going to be national ones that might have misgivings. And then certainly some of the people uh, in some of the culture, and there's certainly in film, I mean, I think that, that there's, there is a state subsidy through the incentives for film, and people have been wanting to bolster that, that area, but also music and other areas. Um, it's interesting. I always thought that those mapping documents and all these initiatives that came out of the UK wouldn't work at all if there weren't these arrangements in place, because then one would just not you know, have uh, design services or, or legal services or whatever from those places. Deloitte and Touche would not be working you know, in Brazil, but they are at this moment. They're working in Costa Rica, so on and so forth. They, it wouldn't be so internationalized that way. They would promote their own auditing services, so on and so forth. Um, that is a debate. That's a debate in Costa Rica right now. Uh, there are sectors that really want to oppose just uh, crumbling under those arrangements. But Costa Rica signed the free trade agreement. Okay, I had a question for you um, that gets back to Afro reggae, which I know you only talked about briefly, but um, it's also a question about the movie you cited in your article, which I just skimmed, um, called Favela Rising. And I have, I'm asking about it because I think that it brings us back to some of the questions we were asking yesterday about the precariat and about the possibility for coalitions across nations and across classes. Because it seems to me that movie, for those of you who haven't seen it, is trying to make, is, it's a documentary about Afro-reggae um, that's made by two Americans and that 
then they took back and showed to um, inner city high schools in America to get them to think about the way that their communities were similar to the favelas and how Afro reggae um, speaks to their life as well. And so it's a really interesting example in that sense for me. Um, but then one, uh, there are a couple things about it that I also find kind of problematic. And when I watched the DVD, the commentary, um, the two directors, Matt Mokery and Jeff Symbolist, talk about how they came up with the idea for the movie because they live in Brooklyn, um, I think in Bushwick, and they were like, we want to go somewhere and, and see a community like this and make a movie about it. Um, so of course, they didn't stay in their community. They went to Brazil. Um, and you know, then they, um, you know, I think that's just interesting in itself. They couldn't connect to their own community. They had to go you know, do this. And then um, the way, this is a, a, a point that I think can maybe speaks to some of your um, interest, Juan, in what uh, literature students can do or people who are interested in text. Like for me, the way the narrative is set up, it minimalizes the aspect of the struggle you were talking about, George, with about security and the way that Afro reggae was a way to negotiate with the yeah. police and um, provide greater security. So it foregrounds the concept of Afro reggae as expression. Mm -hmm. And that's the message that these students in America are getting. So does a cultural artifact like that help us critique neoliberalism or does it prevent it? <laughs> By criticizing it, actually, uh, together with a political scientist, we taught, we used that in a class. And genre questions come to play. Who becomes the protagonist? The protagonist becomes one of the players, not the guy who formed Afro Reggae, who was, became skillful at negotiating and all this, who's always behind the scenes. So all of a sudden you get a heroization of a particular agent of, of a process that's very multiple, right? That's very complex, but it gets reduced to some kind of narrative with, this is one of the things we talk about. One of the problems with narrative is that, I teach literature too, <laughs> but the problems with narrative is that, is that the multiplicity of factors that go into agency gets slotted into actors called characters. And that's a hor horrible problem when, when you're trying to see, unpack the forces that are producing different kinds of results. Narrative often packages things in ways that have that problem. And this was clear in, Afro in, in um, what's the name of the film, of uh, Favela Rising, uh, where so much gets put into the agency of that, of that protagonist and everything else gets foregrounded. It's all about his struggle in life, the fact that he got hurt. It becomes a melodrama. Right? So there's a series of generic constraints that they used to romanticize so on and so forth that uh, really don't. So one of the, th one of the re what Andrew was saying, in order to do a proper textual analysis of that, is not just a genre, you, then you have to know something about Afro reggae. You have to know something about Junior. You have to know the negotiations with the police, with the narco traffickers. You have to know all these things in order to then say, ah, this particular portrayal fitting certain genre uh, paradigms is missing a lot. So that means that takes you away from the text, but in order to come back to it and say, well, these are the things that are missing. Okay, just to, um, I think, to follow up a little bit uh, on the past question, I mean, George, you know, I know these projects mostly thank to you and as my former advisor, and so, uh, you know, I've been fascinated by following through these um, projects during the last 10 years in Brazil and, and parallel projects uh, elsewhere. Um, in the beginning of your talk, you were talking about the, you know, the projects, the massive projects for moving populations out of certain areas in order to create global heritage focused urban redevelopment projects and and how that of course is um, hugely problematic for some populations and then move to focus more on community community protagonism in uh, projects that then were more valuable and which had a chance for producing cultural development that had a better distributional outcome um, but I just wanted to see you know to what extent the la the sets of projects you're presenting Afro Reggae and the Favela Bajo projects, and then the, the last projects you presented with uh, books from uh, Falcon and, and others are, 
are you able to tie them together? Or I just wanted to reintroduce politics a little bit, um, that I think disdain for particular forms of cultural projects and rehabilitative heritage projects doesn't just come from you know Italian critical theory. Right. I mean, a lot of actually a lot of the projects you talked about at the end of your talk, from my perspective, are diametrically opposed to Afroreggae and to Favela Bajo and to that whole moment of early 1990s, um, you know, which valued a particular set of you know fetishized forms of blackness, a particular spectrum of popular culture, you know, let's, you know, which now in Rio has talked about the let's take off our shirts and play drums approach right. to cultural development. Yeah. And, uh, and that a lot of these projects you talked about at the end are the, the product of a really strong new black modernist movement, what, you know, they call themselves modernistas, that's much more interested in the current conditions that produce violence and the felt, some of these yeah. films, you know, they black out, black out, they, blur the faces of the children and the bodies and they and they emphasize shadows, emphasize different techniques that emphasize the structural conditions you might say of that produce these identities and which blur the bodies and the and the racialization processes, you know, as opposed to Afro Reggae or as opposed to City of God, which, you know, literally oils up the body and pres <coughs> presents a certain kind of black. So I just wanted to reintroduce politics, reintroduce the disdain is very much alive in community cultural development initiatives and disdain for certain projects. But that's part of the politics of yeah. cultural development. So I, I think you were hinting to that, but then in, in a sense, in order to critique the simplistic global criticisms, you know, maybe the politics of Rio de Janeiro is capable of actually incorporating that disdain in certain ways. So. Oh, yeah. Uh, there's a lot of that. Uh, there's the book by Hanshard, right? Uh, goes into the different uh, debates within the black movement between the culturalists and the the uh, the more political, the, well, let's say the more political non-culturalists uh, within that, and I think that does replay. But there's also connections. M. V. Bill is one of the godfathers as well of Afro reggae, and there are there are. I think it's of of a similar order that. It's, it's interesting. They're not outside the dialogue with each other. Same thing with Katya Lund, who made City of God, to which Envy Bill reacted very strongly. She was the co-director, right? But she's also one of the filmmakers that gives filmmaking lessons in the favelas to Kufas, to the community. So there's, what there is, it's interesting. It's something that was valorized by the people from the, uh, European uh, Institute of Progressive Cultural Policies, which is a kind of debate that can be conflicted, but is not going to uh, end up, you know, in arms. And I do see that what you're talking about. Great. Just a comment on two things. First of all, the information society transformation, and secondly, the what to do about being a textualist. So, on the issue of the shift from information, I think two things account for this to the extent that that shift has happened. One is that there was an emptiness in terms of content to a lot of the debates about the knowledge society, the information society and so on. A lot of them were technicist, both in the way that David was explaining yesterday in terms of the engineering expertise to create things, but also in terms of how networks themselves function. So they were like flow charts, flow diagrams, mm -hmm. critical path diagrams mm -hmm. in certain ways. That had to change because of two things. Uh, the first thing is that content actually became recognized by the mid-90s as a terribly important part of all of this. So text mattered, and how text resonated with audiences mattered. So I think that's a, an, an extraordinary transformation that is partly related to the deindustrialization that we were describing yesterday of the first world and the importance of textualization and subjectification as an export process, as well as a domestic control process. So I think that's very important. The second element is that culture became quite clearly a terrain of struggle in terms of resistance to all kinds of globalized phenomena. Mm -hmm. And the idea that if you have these wires, then your life will be better, was simply supplanted by a notion of well, what is in the wires, and right. who, as it were, what is being 
transmitted across them and who has access to determining that. Okay, so I think that's, those are the, so culture as a terrain of resistance plus culture as an economic resource meant that the information society became an insufficiently capacious paradigm. And the second thing, very quickly, about what to do if you're text-based, it seems to me there are two guides here. One is the studies in the sociology of knowledge slash science and technology studies model of Bruno Latour, where the idea is threefold. There's a thing called the natural world, there's a thing called social power, and there's a thing called text. And these refer respectively to, if you like, processes and subjects that operate via, if you like, biology, physics, chemistry, and so on, that are real. Many of them are in this room and do things, purposively and accidentally. Secondly, there is the social world, which is very much about relations of power uh, and how they determine culture, in this case. And the third is textual inscription, where the norms of how you write a scientific refereed article and the norms of how you produce a narrative to get a film generated, like Favela Rising, and the norms of how you run a meeting uh, as a text mm -hmm. help to determine what's there. And what he's basically trying to do when he comes up with this trichotomy is to say that Derrida is reductive when it's all the third, Bourdieu right. is reductive when it's all the second, and big science is reductive when it's all the first, and you need all three. Right. And then the next thing about textualization or textual questions would be Chartier's model of the book, where Chartier is trying to say, I want to, un Roger Chartier, I want to understand in order to know what 13th century libraries anywhere in the world did, where the books were that were on them, what the books were physically made of, how, m how much, in a sense, interpolation of readers there would have been, what traces of readerly protocols we can find and so on, and then I'll know what texts are. I, I want just to concentrate for a moment on uh, the neoliberal aspects of this. Um, there's a sense in which over the past few days we've been involved in doing what I said <coughs> humanities does best, which is a project of, tr of self-translation, right, of translating ourselves um, to ourselves. But I just want to raise some questions about uh, the relation of thinking about the complexities of the neoliberal in relation to its uh, own history and its prehistory, you might say. Um, and so um, I, it's useful, I think, to think of neoliberal states ordering themselves around two um, principal uh, modalities. Um, <clears throat> the first I'll call for want of a better term, although there's a point to calling it this, uh, mixture or intercourse. Right, that is, it promotes itself uh, in terms of, um, of promoting a set of interactions, uh, both for the sake of commerce and for the sake of regulating itself, uh, through these forms of mixture, uh, which, which um, cut across all kinds of um, demographic uh, and indeed cultural sets of considerations. Um, you know, that um, one can ask why it is that a certain moment, you know, uh, interracial mixture becomes a focal point, uh, right? And it has something to do with these underlying uh, structures. And where mixture breaks down, the second form, uh, where, where the forms of intercourse don't quite regulate in the way um, that are, are projected, um, violence kicks in, right? The, the designation of of rogues within states and of rogue states, so become the operative sets of conditions uh, around which neoliberal order uh, then uh, projects itself. And, and to tie it to your sort of discussion about uh, the, the criminal, uh, there's both a criminalization of culture and a culture of criminalization that sort of interact um, at, at the same time. Um, so those slogans that you, but I, I, I want to trouble um, the sort of divide of the neoliberal as important as it is to recognize these transformations that have been taking place in, in the commonplace, you might say. Um, the, the, the slogan, you know, the liberal slogan, you, you were quoting your alter ego, That's right? right. Okay. Yeah. Um, enrich yourself, which is really, I think, of not so much as, or, or a, a form of, of translating that is really enlighten yourself in the classic liberal conception, right? Uh, and the way in which, you know, um, cultural work works in that 
regime to enlighten, mm -hmm. um, in contrast with uh, express yourself. And, and yet at the same time, the sharpness of that distinction is probably just um, over, over expressed, right? And it's exactly that, you know, you know to, to, to think about both the continuities and the disruptions sort of as they come into play with each other. Right, and so I think, for example, I mean, just to put some um, exemplification on this, I think of those early um, city festivals, uh, early in the sense that they're at the moment at which neoliberal neo um, strands are just beginning to emerge, like in the mid-1970s, right? So before we recognize them as such. So I think, for example, of the National Arts Festival in Grahamstown in South Africa, which is a ma has been and continues to be a really major event mm -hmm. once a year that transforms a city of 40,000, a surrounding area of 100,000, into twice the size for 10 days, right? And is an incredible cultural expression on the one, or set of expressions on the one hand, across all the arts, right? Um, uh, you know, in a, 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 a complex uh, racial, ethno-racial um, area that has a long history at the interface of Afrikaanerness, uh, Englishness, and blackness in South Africa, right? Um, and 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 you know, and is used by the city to transform itself, or of the or of the Edinburgh Film Festival, or mm -hmm. of or the Edinburgh Festival, of a whole range of film festivals in different places that. That in a way, you know, contemporary mm -hmm. transformations of the urban through these festival makings, like the LA Book Festival and so on, sort of, ha you know, have a long history. And, 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 and so to wonder about not just that history, but that history in relation to a much, much, much longer history of, you know, early Renaissance cities engaging culture to mark themselves in certain ways, right? So I'm, I'm just sort of wondering about the relation between the emergence of the modern uh, and the late, late modern and the, the relations between them precisely in terms of these cultural expressions, if not cultural policy itself. Thank you. I think that um, you've just done me a big favor because I'm trying to ratchet up some of my arguments with Lazzarato and <laughs> you've helped out. <laughs> 